So I'm Willy Semmler. Um, I'm economics department member and uh, researcher at the SIPA Institute. Uh, I organize there uh, some research on uh, climate change and the macroeconomics of climate change. Um, so I want to welcome the audience. I know, I know most of you, you know me, we have done it many times, these uh, public lecture talks. Um, and I also want, want to welcome my guests, external guests, the ambassador of Barbados is here and uh, some other from other ministries or consulates are here. And um, so welcome to everybody and also some other representatives from other divisions are here. Uh, first, let me thank uh, the director of the SIPA, uh, Teresa Gilarducci, and uh, her staff, Bridget Fisher, and Audra, and Julia, and there are uh, some uh, uh, very active uh, persons behind the screen, and they have prepared everything for tonight. Um, the lecture series that, or this event tonight, is part of a lecture series that uh, we started about three years ago, uh, a number of conferences uh, organized ne uh, besides this or before this. These lecture series are funded by the uh, Thyssen Foundation in Germany, uh, also, also supported by the German Consulate and the German Science Foundation and the, the Macroeconomic Institute of uh, uh, Germany. Um, we were lucky to have this lecture series for three years, and I got the news just a few days ago. We got an f n another uh, funding for another three years now from the Thyssen Foundation. So uh, we will stick together for a while and try to uh, keep this uh, issue uh, at the forefront of the discussion. So um, now uh, we will have tonight first uh, speaker and. Uh, hard and uh, but before we start with the speaker I uh, want to uh, give a short uh, word to uh, Tim Marshall our provost uh, will say a few words and uh, uh, Tim was uh, uh, the Dean of Parsons School of Design Tim is now the uh, chief academic officer in charge of uh, well the academic side of the, uh, edu uh, the uh, new school he has uh, initiated large number of international cooperations and uh, uh, links to uh, uh, institutions in uh, other parts of the world. And he's now also a very active part to uh, somewhat to widen the cooperation of the climate change discussion within the university. So I would like to let him speak for a little bit. Thank you. Thank you for coming. Thank you very much. Thank you, Willie. So, uh, good evening. It is my great pleasure to, to be part of welcoming you to tonight's event and to say a few words to you about what the new school's activity in regards to climate change, which we are actually uh, in very proud of and increasingly proud of us with the work that's been going on. Uh, you'll hear more about that as the evening goes on, but I'll say a few words. The Schwartz Center for Economic Policy Analysis at the new school has put forward an extensive and diverse agenda on climate change. But this is only part of the larger university initiative. The new school, as a forward-thinking institution, has recently been in the press as it proactively combats the major causes of climate change and searches for innovative ways to mitigate as well as to adapt to global warming. This year, the university will pursue a comprehensive plan to address climate change. For example, the Parsons School of Design has a long tradition of engaging in contemporary societal debates and offering creative solutions to society's most pressing problems. Climate change, rather clearly, is the most glaring challenge of the 21st century and is tackled by Parsons in diverse ways, ranging from landscape design to the urban design, green design and creative energy conservation in a whole myriad of ways, whether it be clothing, housing, interiors, all through media. Everybody touches sustainability in one way or another. The new school students, faculty, and alumni in both New York and Paris have expanded on already diverse curriculum with novel options novel options for understanding the environment and climate justice. In fact, Parsons Paris, our school in Paris, has been there since 1921, is actually engaging with Sciences Po and Bruno Latour on his, the work he's doing in preparing for uh, COP21 in Paris, with a very innovative approach to trying to unpack and rethink uh, the diplomacy and how to think about diplomacy in relationship to climate change. So you may be interested in that. Um, 
but that's a very exciting program going on in Paris, so it's not just in New York City. Uh, at its heart, the Tishman Environment and Design Center, which is housed in our School of Milano, an organization, is an organization that will foster the integration of design strategies with cre creative, social, and ecological approaches to environmental issues. A proactive campaign for fossil fuel divestment was hatched in 2013 when the university's student senate presented several resolutions to the new school's board of trustee in support of divestment. Since that time, students in collaboration with university leadership have been raising awareness about the issue through a series of public events across the campus. And we are in the process of divesting from fossil fuels. Overall, teaching, research, curriculum, and community engagement leading sustainable climate solutions has become core values and day-to-day -day practices at the new school. So it's both, it's, all, it's in our curriculum and in our research, but increasingly we want it also in our practice of how we actually live in this campus. It is one of the most sustainable campuses in the US and we continue to, to make it more so. On the academic front, extensive research has been undertaken by a team of researchers at the new school's Department of Economics and the Schwartz Center. Led by Professor Willie Semler, the Economics of Climate Change Project features conferences, workshops, public speaker series, and lunchtime lectures that will foster student engagement, that all foster student engagement. As Willie said, it's been funded by the Walker Foundation, the Tyson Foundation, the German Science Foundation, the Macroeconomic Policy Institute, Hans Bocklas Stiftung, Germany, and the German Consulate in New York City have all sponsored the New York, the Economics of Climate Change Project. And as Willie just said, has, we are delighted that it's been extended for another three years. Uh, some of the results of this research project are presented in the Oxford Handbook of the Macroeconomics of Global Warming. And I gather this will be discussed in more detail during the book presentation tonight, following the talk by Selwyn Hart, himself the director of the UN's Secretary General's Climate Change Support Team. Director Hart brings a message of ur urgency and hope at a time when so much the future of mankind and sustainable living conditions on Earth is at stake. So I want to thank you again, welcome you back to, to the new school, and I trust you'll enjoy and find a lot of value in, in this evening's proceedings. I'll hand it back to Willie. Thank you, Willie. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Tim. Okay. So uh, as uh, the provost announced, there will be a book reception later at 7.30. Uh, you are all welcome to stay, and after that there are some snacks and drinks, and so some more uh, uh, things to relax. So uh, let me uh, introduce briefly um, Director Hart. Director Hart is um, Director of the United Nations Secretary General's Climate Change uh, Support Team. So uh, Director General has a big team, the, the um, Secretary General has a big team to work for the climate issue. Um, we are lucky to have him tonight, and I was also dreaming somebody about getting an economy at the forefront of those issues, and tonight we have one. So um, he is an economist specialized in um, international finance, in um, trade planning, in strategic management, and has a lot of experience in uh, public services. And uh, he was a um, senior foreign service officer of Barbados Ministry of Foreign Affairs. He uh, uh, was advisor to uh, the uh, Caribbean Development Bank, uh, in particular on um, financing climate change. Um, he is uh, deeply involved in negotiations um, to establish the Green Climate Fund in um, Mexico, in um, Cancun. Uh, he is an um, advisor for uh, various organizations in Barbados designing a green climate fund. So you see more and more the finance aspects co aspect comes in. He is a counselor at the per permanent mission of Barbados as a, to the UN, responsible for economic and financial affairs. And now comes his uh, UN uh, activities. Um, he is, uh, uh, Caribbean's uh, top climate change negotiator at the UN uh, for several years. He leads uh, uh, is the lead uh, negotiator of uh, the Alliance of Small Island States. You have heard about the threats of the small islands. Uh, he is the leading climate, uh, the leading climate um, change uh, spokesman at the UN and inter in international conferences, in particular in North America, in Europe, Middle East, uh, and in other regions. And he is preparing now, as you saw from the title, The Road to Paris. 
And uh, this is not an easy work, it's very challenging because uh, there are 170, 100 nation aid uh, countries involved and uh, uh, so to speak it's very difficult uh, to train the cats to run in the same direction and so that is very challenging and we will hear today how he's preparing to manage this that some good outcome will be there in uh, Paris in the uh, end of November, beginning of um, December. So please come forward and we are looking forward to your talk. So thank you very much. Good afternoon um, to all of you. Um, Professor Semler, Ambassador Marshall, other distinguished members of the faculty, um, your team, Julia, and the others who have been extremely supportive in getting me here and extremely patient as well. Um, it's certainly an honor and a privilege for me to be here at the new school. The road to Paris and beyond, creating a climate agreement that works. As Professor Semler indicated, I spent most of my professional career, or a considerable amount of it, I'm not as young as I look, just let me first issue that disclaimer. Uh, I spent a significant amount of my professional career defending the interests of the smallest and the most vulnerable countries in the global community. Not only to climate change, but a range of, range of shocks, um, economic and environmental and also social shocks. And there's one enduring lesson that that experience has, has taught me, is that the United Nations and multilateralism is the greatest protector of the most vulnerable and the poorest members of global society, of the global society. So I, en I encourage all of you at this prestigious institution really to be defenders of the United Nations. Um, it has its flaws, it's not perfect, but it is in my view, the best source or a great source of, of inspiration and protection um, to the most vulnerable members of society, of the global community, and in a real sense, um, in most societies. The year 2015 is a crucial year for addressing poverty, inequality, and insecurity. As you can see from this timeline that I have on the screen, we're expecting three major outcomes this year that could potentially transform how we deal with the major challenges of our time. There's the Financing for Development Conference in July in Addis, which aims to renew the global framework for, for financing development. In September, there's the post-2015 Development Summit, where the post-2015 development agenda, with a new set of sustainable development goals at its core, will be adopted. And finally, in Paris in December, countries will meet to adopt a new universal and meaningful climate change agreement. To say that these three important agendas are interlinked and deeply intertwined would be an understatement. The Secretary General has called sustainable development and climate action, and I quote, two sides of the same coin. And in a real sense, financing, which is the focus of the Financing for Development Conference, enables action and ambition on both fronts. At Davos this year, the Secretary General said, and I quote, we are the first generation that can end poverty and the last generation that can take steps to avoid the worst impacts of climate change, end of quote. 
So therefore, these three major conferences will have a significant impact on the global development landscape for generations to come. The conference in Paris will be the last of the three major conferences this year. However, what is expected of the conference in Paris or the 21st session of the Conference of Parties to the UN FCCC, sometimes called COP20. So when you hear me say COP20, so, sorry, COP, COP21, I mean the Paris meeting. The mandate for COP21 or the Paris meeting, meeting and its outcome was derived from the Durban Platform for Enhanced Action, which was adopted at COP20 at COP17 in Durban, South Africa in 2011. In the decision adopted in Durban, it was agreed to launch a process to develop, when I quote, a protocol, another legal instrument, or an agreed outcome with legal force under the Climate Convention applicable to all parties, and that this process would conclude at COP21 in 2015. So that is the mandate on which the current negotiations are based. That mandate provides clarity on what the expected outcome would be. Now there are three possible options. It also importantly stated that the outcome would be applicable to all parties. And it also clearly identified a conclusion date. COP21 um, in 2015. And it also said that the new agreement under negotiation would enter into force in 2020. The Durban, the, the Durban decision initiated a new stage in the evolution of the multilateral climate regime. For two decades, parties have struggled to effectively combat climate change. While our collective knowledge of the causes and impacts of climate change has grown exponentially over the past two decades, the paradox is that global emissions have grown at their fastest rate in human history, and the political response to climate change has fallen way short of the demands of science. Designing an international agreement that is effective in the fight against climate change is by no means an easy task. And the failure of governments to do so to date should not be seen as a failure of the multilateral system or the climate regime itself. In the course of its evolution, the regime has had to balance the interests and political economies of over 190 countries at different stages of development and on an issue with far-reaching economic, political, social, and for some existential consequences. This has resulted in suboptimal outcomes when measured against the scale and urgency of the climate challenge. In a real sense, from the start of the UNFCCC negotiations in the early 1990s, Parties to the convention have struggled to choose between two competing models, a top-down approach favoring binding targets and timetables like those under the Kyoto Protocol, and a bottom-up approach favoring voluntary actions defined unilaterally under a loose frame -like framework like those that emerged under the Copenhagen Accord in 2009. Both approaches have not been effective in the fight against climate change, as neither has achieved the level of participation nor ambition needed to reverse the continued rise of global greenhouse gas emissions. The level of participation in the Kyoto Protocol was insufficient to make it an effective instrument to, sl to slow the rise in global emissions. It had many good things, but it did not slow the rate of, of the rise in global emissions. And as successive reports 
from the from UNEP have shown the gap is widening between the ambition level of pledges made in Copenhagen and what is required to place the world on a below two degrees pathway. So in a real sense, as I said, both approaches have really not been effective um, in the fight, of, fight against climate change. I agree with, with, um, with Daniel Bodansky, who has said that the Durban platform negotiations present an opportunity to form an alternative approach drawing on the best of both models. So why am I optimistic about Paris and what sets Paris apart from other stages in the climate regime? The Secretary General has voiced optimism over the prospects for an agreement in Paris. And of course, I have to agree with the Secretary General on this. Arguably, the science, economics, and politics of climate change are much better aligned than ever. On the scientific front, the fifth assessment report of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the IPCC, was released last year in 2014. This report was authored by thousands of scientists and represents the most comprehensive scientific assessment of climate change ever conducted. Three key messages emerge from the fifth assessment report of the IPCC and make the scientific case for urgent action on climate change clearer than ever. First, the first message is that human influence on the climate system is clear. GHG emissions in our atmosphere have increased to levels unprecedented in the last 800,000 years. And report also find that there's 95% certainty that human influence is the dominant cause of global, of, of global warming since 1950. The second important message is that the window for action is rapidly closing. In 2011, we had used up almost two thirds of the carbon budget for a higher probability of limiting global warming to under two degrees. And it's illustrated in this graph here. The report also found that greater warming increases the likelihood of severe and irreversible impacts. So the longer we wait, the higher the cost to solve the problem. Projected impacts will have serious consequences for people, assets, economies, and ecosystems. And report also stated, people who are socially, economically, culturally, politically, and otherwise marginalized are especially vulnerable to climate change and will face greater challenges given their limited ability to cope. The third message from the fifth assessment report is that it's quite positive. That third message states that we have the means to limit climate change and build a more prosperous and sustainable future. The report found that mitigating climate change is both affordable and technically feasible. In business as usual scenarios, ambitious mitigation would reduce growth by around 0 0.06 percentage points over the century. This is really a very small price to pay for avoiding climate disruption. Now, on the political front, the politics around climate change at the global level has improved significantly since Copenhagen in 2009, um, where in a real sense, the regime was under threat of collapse. 
the historic US-China joint announcement last year was a game changer in the multilateral process. The fact that the US and China, who collectively account for more than 40% of global emissions and who have not always agreed, that's putting it mildly, mildly on climate change, have now agreed to work col collaboratively on climate. And this joint announcement has injected positive momentum in the climate negotiating process. On the economic front, the new, the new climate economy report of 2014 makes a strong case for economic growth and climate action as mutually reinforcing. The report states that, and I quote, many of the policy and institutional reforms needed to revitalize growth and improve well-being over the next 15 years are also key to tackling climate risk. There is considerable scope for countries to press forward with reforms that both energize development and grapple with, with climate risk. In 2014, green bond issuance tripled over that of 2013, with a record seven billion in, in issuances from international development banks. This shows a strong signal that more investors and institutions are interested in financing that has a positive environmental impact, but also that they are economic opportunities to be had. The cost of renewable energy is falling significantly. The cost of PV installations have fallen nearly 60% since 2009, while the cost of onshore wind farms has fallen by 12%. According to the recently released global trend in renewable energy investment in 2015, Global investment in renewable power and fuels was 270.2 billion in 2014, nearly 17% higher than the previous year. This was the first increase in three years and reflected several influences, including a boom in solar installations in China and Japan, totaling 74.9 billion between these two countries and a record 18.6 billion of final investment decisions on offshore wind projects in Europe. Lastly, we are seeing a rapid acceleration of climate action from non-traditional actors, meaning beyond national governments. We are seeing a growing segment of the private sector, subnational entities, and the finance industry really stepping up to be part of the solution, not just waiting for national governments to set certain policies in place, but seizing first mover advantage and taking it upon themselves to be the first actors to be trendsetters and drive government action on climate change. The Climate Summit convened by the Secretary General last September highlighted many multi-stakeholder climate actions taking place and embodied the spirit of the collaborative approach society must take together in order to adequately tackle climate change. Hundreds of cooperative initiatives are now on the way, bringing together public, private, and civil society actors to, to collaborate in accelerating climate action across the planet. We're seeing private and public sector actors collaborating to accelerate implementation of energy efficiency and coalitions of palm oil producers committing to halt deforestation. We're seeing low emission technologies rapidly increasing their market share and, increasing, and increasingly large numbers of investors, universities and business committing to divest from fossil fuels. We're seeing cities, states, and regions making increasingly ambitious commitments to climate action, 
such as the state of California recently announced a 40% emission reduction goal by 2030. Or the 26 European cities with a combined GDP of 2, two trillion euros that recently committed to prioritize climate action through policy making and procurement. Having said all that, where are we on the road to Paris? Not just sitting in rooms in the UN, in, in the UN negotiating. COP21 is being organized around four key pillars. The agreement, INDCs or intended nationally determined contributions. This is just what negotiators decided would be the way to express a country's commitment um, to tackle climate change, its climate action. Um, they wanted to ensure that it was clear that these commitments would be nationally determined. So they're called intended nationally determined contributions. It's just a target, a country's commitment or target. The action agenda, which I mentioned earlier, was launched at the climate summit and finance. Now the COP president, France, has overall responsibility for, for guiding this process. And this is how the French presidency of the Conference of the Parties, which is the supreme decision-making body of member states. This is how the French have framed the outcomes um, at Paris. So countries agreed at COP19 in Warsaw to submit these intended nationally determined contributions some two years ago. They agreed then to, in, um, to intensify their domestic preparations and to communicate their country's INDC well in advance of COP21 in Paris. During COP20 last year in Lima, parties further agreed that the INDCs should represent a progression beyond current mitigation efforts and that there would be no backsliding, meaning that countries would not commit below what they have had previously committed. At this juncture, some 36 countries have submitted their INDCs. As the Warsaw and Lima decisions indicate, countries are to commit these or, or, or to present or submit these INDCs well in advance um, of, of um, Paris. And at this juncture, juncture, some 36 countries, the US, the 28 members of the European Union, Norway, Mexico, Switzerland, um, Russia, Gabon, Andorra, and Liechtenstein They've, they have submitted their INDCs. For us to achieve both a meaningful and universal agreement, we need not only INDCs that cover most of the world's emissions, but we need as many countries as possible to submit their INDCs to achieve that universality. To de and also to demonstrate that all countries have skin in the game. And you may remember that phrase, which was in the Durban decision that launched these negotiations, applicable to all, which um, uh, is supposed to ensure that the agreement has a universal character. And I think that this is the reality that all countries want to be part of the agreement. What countries, from the smallest and the poorest, they've indicated 
they want to be part of this new agreement. To date, the process to prepare and submit INDCs is well underway in many countries, and we hope to see most of the major economies submitting their INDCs before the end of June, if not well before Paris. It is important to note that the INDCs are intended contributions, so they should be viewed as a first offer and they should also be seen as a floor rather than a ceiling of a country's ambition. On the action agenda, which is the other pillar, France, Peru, and the UNFCCC, along with the UN Secretary General, are working together on the Lima Paris Action Agenda. This work aims to build on the success of the 2014 Climate Summit by strengthening and broadening the range of coalitions, actors, and stakeholders mobilized around climate action. And it also serves to demonstrate that climate action is occurring in all sectors, which should encourage governments to take on higher levels of ambition. The de this Secretary General has demonstrated his leadership in this area, area through the Climate Summit, and it will be important to maintain the momentum that was generated by that event. It is hoped that complementary action by stakeholders like the private sector and cities not only encourage more ambition, but can also positively influence the climate negotiations towards a new climate agreement. On finance, good progress has been made in the operationalization of the Green Climate Fund. Over 10 billion has been pledged towards the initial capitalization of the fund, and the board of the fund has made good progress in putting the final touches um, on the fund to ensure it can begin disbursing resources by Paris. Work is also underway on other elements of a finance package, which helps to build trust and confidence in the negotiations, while also enabling higher levels of ambition from developing countries. I will now focus on the agreement itself. Several meetings, part of the formal negotiating process under the UNFCC and informal meet and other informal meetings have been occurring over the course of this year with the aim of finalizing this new global climate agreement. What we currently have as a negotiating text is around 90 pages. It is still quite long, but we're already coming out ahead of Copenhagen, um, where the draft negotiated text going into Copenhagen was nearly 200 pages long. So we're a bit ahead. Now this takes me to, to some of the difficult political issues that which need to be tackled on the road to Paris as, as countries negotiate this new agreement. There are legal, the legal form of the agreement, the issue of finance, differentiation, how to raise ambition, and achieving political parity between adaptation and mitigation. On the issue of legal form, the new agreement is supposed to, to take the form of a protocol, another legal instrument, or agreed outcome with legal force. Um, those were the three options which were contained in the decision that launched the negotiating process. We know that for some parties, um, 
a protocol is or a ratifiable agreement um, might be out of the question. I, I sense negotiations are ongoing. I can't be absolute about this. But some countries have indicated that it will be difficult for them to have the uh, have an agreement with the sort of highest legal force. There is also discussion on whether the entire 2015 outcome will be embedded in a legally binding agreement or only certain parts of this agreement. Parties are well aware that the final agreement on legal form will have or could have implications on the level of participation in the new agreement. And therefore, a very delicate balance has to be struck between having the highest legal stringency of national undertakings in the agreement with the imperative of universal participation. So in a real sense, this is the balance, balancing that, that negotiators have to navigate. Um, if you want certain countries on board, the commitments embedded in the new agreement um, might not necessarily be um, of the highest legal, might not have the highest legal force. And if country X is not participating, it, it is clear that their economic competitors will also not participation um, will not be participating so legal s stringency versus participation is one of the issues that negotiators are grappling with however you need an agreement that has some legal force so that everyone knows or has some degree of certainty that countries will do what they commit to do Second is the issue of ambition. As I mentioned earlier, the INDCs um, are slowly coming in. And the INDCs are intended, or intended nationally determined contributions, are, are intended to be almost at the heart of the new agreement. They are the demonstration they are to demonstrate what countries intend to do over the next five years, 2020 to 2025, or in some instances from 2020 to 2030. Some countries have submitted five-year commitments and targets. Others have submitted 10-year commitments and targets. We will have to find ways to ensure accountability of actors and ways that the agreement can strengthen climate ambition over time. Will parties be required to update their, their national contributions at regular intervals? And what will that process be, if any? Parties are also discussing a range of political and technical elements that would signal that ambition of national commitments, that the ambition level of national commitments will increase over time. Oops. Finance. The Cancun agreements in 2010 contain a commitment by developed countries to mobilize 100 billion per year by 2020 from public and private sources to address developing country needs. It also established the Green Climate Fund. And there is a demand from the developing world for a credible pathway demonstrating that developed countries will meet the $100 billion goal. And the question is what resources will be available to developing countries to build their resilience 
and support the transition to a low carbon economy. Now, the other difficult political issue under consideration is the issue of a differentiation. The issue of differentiation is one of the more difficult issues that um, the regime has had to deal with. As you know, climate change um, um, is caused by cumulative emissions. And those countries that have, that are more developed are most responsible for current climate change. So there is a historical responsibility that more developed countries have um, to combat climate change. However, if we are to address climate change now, um, or if we are to hold the increase in global temperature to below two degrees, as you'd have seen in my second slide, the reality is we've already exhausted two thirds of the carbon budget. So we also have to tackle current emissions. However, the reality is that the, in the 190 odd UN system, countries are, are at different levels of development. And it would not be fair to expect India, which has 400 million persons who don't have access to um, basic electricity services, for example, to, but is one of the fastest gr growing economies, it would be grossly unfair to, ex to expect India to undertake or to take the same degree of action on climate change than the United States, for, for example. So this is where the principle of common but differentiated responsibility, CBDR, um, it's a core principle in the climate regime. But it really needs to now reflect current realities. Because I use India as an example, but I could use other developing countries um, who have, over the course of the last two decades or so, also experienced rap rapid um, rates of economic growth and who are now in a position to undertake greater responsibilities in addressing the problem of climate change. But I work for the UN, so I can't have an opinion on that. So in this new agreement, what will be the new understanding on CBDR, if any? My own view is that CBDR um, needs to remain or should remain a core principle under the convention. It, it remains a core principle under the convention. However, it needs to evolve to take into account current realities. And in a real sense, the US-China joint announcement as well as the decisions that have been taken on the nationally determined contributions or the scope of nationally determined contributions point us, give us a way forward. In the US-China joint announcement, both countries determine what they, their own national effort should be. Um, it was not imposed on anyone. It was through a process of self determination and while the scope and the scope of the contribution or commitment that each country intended to take is 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 somewhat different china announced the peaking year um it announced um, a number of sectoral targets and the u.s announced um an economy-wide emission 
reduction target. So each country demonstrated that it will take action, taking into account its own national circumstances and um, respective capabilities. But the question, or one of the questions um, that would need to be addressed is how to reflect differentiation in other aspects of the agreement, including differentiation in terms of how the rules of the new agreement will be applied. Will there be a common set of rules in the new agreement applicable to all countries? Or will there be some way of differentiating the application of the rules according to developed developing country income level, population size? What, how will there be any form <coughs> of differentiation. And the final difficult issue is the issue of political parity between adaptation and mitigation. From my background as a negotiator for, the, for Barbados and for the Alliance of Small Island Developing States, which is a coalition of just over 40 island states, there was always this complaint from developing countries, the SIDS, the least developed countries, countries in Africa, that adaptation has never been taken seriously under the convention. One of the um, measures of, of, of parity is the resources that are devoted to address one aspect of the problem. And we always quoted the numbers, and the numbers don't lie. Um, while mitigation um, financing would usually account for about 70 to 75% of total climate finance, adaptation financing um, would struggle to get past 20% of total financing um, for climate change. So in the context of the negotiations, developing countries, especially the most vulnerable, have been calling for political parity between adaptation and mitigation. Now, how that political parity is expressed in the new agreement is up for debate. There's some proposals for a global goal, a new global goal on adaptation. There are proposals for this goal to be, it could be a qualitative goal or a quantitative goal and quantitative reflecting the need um, to balance adaptation and mitigation financing. Many countries, especially the island countries, have called for um, for the new agreement to contain provisions on loss and damage, given the severity and increasing impacts from climate change. I just have a few minutes left, but I'm not getting to the juicy part of the, <laughs> of the presentation. Now, parse outcomes are the parse agreement. How what are some of the key functions of the Paris Agreement? I really struggle with the title of this slide. I was thinking of calling it, you know, defining or signaling success um, at Paris, because in a real sense, this is why I was invited here to give my thoughts on what are some of the key elements that would make a new climate agreement work. And I've identified six of them. Six, right? Yeah. First, the new agreement and the Paris outcomes should send a clear signal to policymakers 
to the private sector, to investors, entrepreneurs, civil society, and the general public on the direction of travel. A very clear signal. She sent an unambiguous signal that the direction of travel is deep decarbonization. The direction of travel is a low carbon future. And there's general agreement on this in the negotiations. However, parties continue to struggle on, on how to express this signal on destination of travel. Should it be a long-term goal that elaborates on the below two degree goal? Should it only be a mitigation goal, or as I said earlier, should it also be an adaptation goal? So, but there's clarity that the new agreement and accompanying outcomes at Paris must send a clear signal um, to the world, investors, private sector, etc., and policymakers, that the only future is a low carbon future, and that's the destination of travel. Secondly, it must be effective in placing the world on a two degree pathway. So, so it must, in a real sense, be science based and respond to the urgency of science. That response might not be immediate. Um, obviously, there's a feeling that the INDCs that will be submitted um, post 2020 might not be fully consistent with a two-degree pathway, but that governments over time will significantly increase ambition and will, for the most part, overachieve the level of ambition that they commit for this period. There is also a general understanding that the new agreement needs to be fair and equitable. And equity is one of those principles that runs across or cuts across the entire agreement. That it must take into account national circumstances, different levels of development, as well as evolving responsibilities. Fourth, the Paris outcomes in a new agreement must incentivize action and catalyze investments in low carbon climate resilience. And this is an extremely important aspect because the 10 billion um, in the Green Climate Fund or mobilize um, for the Green Climate Fund, the 100 billion that was committed to at Cancun, in a real sense, that's peanuts compared to the trillions required to drive low carbon um, climate resilient growth in developing countries. So this new agreement in sending the signals on direction of travel to, to the private sector, to investors, really needs to be catalytic in um, generating new investments in low carbon climate resilient development. Fifth is trust and confidence. It must build trust and confidence that others are doing what they commit to do. So therefore, whatever systems of the rules, the system um, associated with transparency and accountability would need to be embedded in the agreement, irrespective to its legal form, um, that give all parties trust and confidence that if Jamaica, um, I can call friendly countries, or friends of all, but um, that Jamaica will, com will do what it commits to do, that Barbados will know that its economic competitor, Jamaica, is committing to take, to do what um, um, is living up to their commitment. Finally, and very importantly, this new agreement and the outcomes in Paris must demonstrate solidarity with the most vulnerable and the poorest members of the global community. 
it must do this in a way that recognizes their unique situation and it must also do it in a way that recognizes that these countries and communities in countries have the least capability and capacity to adapt to climate change and have the least responsibility for causing this problem. So finally, COP21 in Paris represents a unique political moment to finalize a new global agreement on climate change that responds to the challenge of climate change while supporting the shift and catalyzing investments towards a low carbon climate resilient future. To get there, we will, to get there will require trust, compromise, collaboration, and political will. It will require countries to balance their individual needs, need for development space with the need for fairness and equity in addressing this historic, this, um, this global problem. Most of all, it can only be achieved in, a true, in the context of a true global partnership. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for this very detailed talk about the, not only the road to Paris, but then out of Paris later and what should be the outcome of Paris. And we have so many questions. So we will have roughly 25 minutes for discussion. Yes. Uh, we have a microphone, though, please speak to the microphone. Thank you very much, Mr. Hart. My name is Graciela Chichilniski. I think we know each other from the Kyoto process, yeah. where I had the good fortune of writing the words for the Kyoto Protocol into the protocol itself in 97, I recall. Yeah. You of that, from that. But one of the points you made, I actually took a photograph, was that the decisions, the outcome of the Paris uh, Agreement has to include some form of resolution of the uh, two degree quadrum. Because above two degree, the IPCC finds the probability is very large for catastrophic outcomes. Mm -hmm. According to the fifth assessment report that was available since 2013, but finally published in 2014 for the IPCC, the only way to do that is carbon negative technologies. Technologies that actually reduce the CO2 that is already in the atmosphere. You didn't even refer to that. Nor is the Green Climate Fund touching that issue. And it's the only way that we can reach the objective that you wrote of avoiding the two degree because it's too late and CO2 is unique as a gas in that it can stay in a stable fashion for hundreds of years. Yeah. So it, we have reached the two-thirds uh, budget, two-thirds of the budget in 2011 with 1,900 gigaton. We have 1,000 gigaton to go. But unless we stop and actually reduce the CO2 that we have already placed in the atmosphere, and we are emitting 37 gigaton every year, we cannot reach the target number two in your slide. We need carbon negative technologies and we need the finance and the fund to address that issue, particularly for building uh, energy power plants in the poorest countries. What do you say to that? Well, the issue of carbon capture and storage and other um, technologies like that is, of course, a very difficult issue that negotiators are struggling with. The reality is that the IPCC has said it, uh, uh, said it in the fifth assessment report that um, CCS and other technologies, well, this was even in era four, that CCS and other technologies 
must be in play must be in play over the long term if we are to achieve these lower stabilization targets. Um, I can't make a recommendation to the board of the Green Climate Fund um, or f any of the multilateral development banks, but the IPCC reports are there and they show quite clearly both AR4 and AR5 the role that technologies like CCS um, will play in the global energy mix in the future. But the reality is it is an extremely expensive technology um, and in some instances it is still very experimental. Um, some have argued, it is not my argument, that it is better to focus on renewable energy, which I fully agree, it will not um, at present um, be the total solution. Energy efficiency, addressing deforestation, and many of the other, and the suite of, of options, mitigation options that have been identified by the summit. But I agree with you, CCS, it is in the AR4 and AR5. It has to be um, um, part of the technological mix. But I can't make a recommendation, <laughs> you know, to the board of the Green Climate Fund to the start. Solutions available now before we see yeah. you can try can to discuss with you. Can yeah, we okay. have maybe um, two, three questions? Are you able to uh, yeah, answer? Because yeah, sure, sure. there are so many questions. Well, we do uh, one from this side and one from this side. So, uh, one there, okay. And then there's the other. Hi. Hi. Um, my name's Lachlan. Short question. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> so, um, most of the experts, the delegates, including the two co chairs of COP21, have already said that they don't think there's going to be an agreement reached in Paris that will limit us from surpassing the two degree limit. It's also been um, on the table that if we can get a commitment to full decarbonization by 2050 in the agreement, that would force the kind of thinking that would keep us from surpassing the two degrees. So what can we do to ensure that that kind of verbiage gets into the agreement? One, just one question more. Yeah, was somebody? Yeah, you just take two questions. Yeah. Uh, yeah, my name is uh, yeah, I'm, my name is Bill Sweet. I'm an independent writer working on a book about climate diplomacy. <laughs> I have a very closely related question, actually. Uh, I understand why you see the U.S.-China agreement as a breakthrough uh, and, a, and a path forward. But if you look at the specific numbers on how much carbon it, uh, China will emit, you know, consistent with that peaking pledge, uh, the quantity of CO2 emissions looks absolutely incompatible with the two-degree goal. At the same time, the Lima mechanism for Boosting ambition seems quite weak. So I was wondering if you could comment on that quandary. Okay. Maybe it takes us two of them. Thanks. Um, on the first question, yes, it looks like the INDCs that are coming in will not be, and this also addresses your question as well, will not be um, fully consistent with the two-degree pathway. That is how it looks at this stage. Um, however, clear signals on the destination of travel, whether it's deep decarbonization, whether it's net zero, whether it's consistency with the I, um, IPCC scenarios, um, is something that parties are considering to embed in the agreement to elaborate on the below two degree objective. The reality is that um, even if the, this first offer of commitment um, are not consistent with the two degree objective. The IPCC has made it clear that all hope um, is not lost. You, you know, I run 5Ks not competitively against myself. I have a goal. My goal is below um, 24 minutes. Now, I know if I run my first kilometer at four minutes 30, um, I stand, um, I can, and my second at four minutes 30, I stand a good chance of finishing under 24 minutes. 
However, if I exceed five minutes over my first kilometer, I really need to accelerate in the final three kilometers. So similarly, um, it's a, it, it might be a poor analogy, but, um, but the reality is that the first round of commitments will, um, as I said, might not be consistent with that two degree pathway, which means that countries really need to accelerate the, the rate of emission reductions in the middle and latter half of this century. Um, to st stand a chance of um, meeting this two-degree objective. Countries all agree. Sending clear signals to policymakers will activate markets. It will move money towards low-carbon investments. And this is key. You know, having language in agreement is fine, but the real test is moving, moving money and markets towards a low carbon future. And this new agreement, with all its imperfections, needs to absolutely do that. It really needs to send the right policy signals to markets, to investors, and it really needs to catalyze investments um, in, these, um, in this area. And it will be more effective, in my view, if it is able to achieve that, then by having the most stringent targets, which countries either don't or will not commit to um, or don't have the means to commit to. Thank you, Mr. Hart. Uh, thank you for your wonderful presentation. I actually have uh, one question regarding to the private sector, uh, because we know, like, started at, uh, in starting at uh, COP19, uh, the private sector actually started taking the center stage and started to um, showing concern on climate change and try to do more things on climate change. So according to your personal uh, estimate, like how do you position uh, the private sector at COP21 and what kind of uh, possible move that they can make during the COP21 as well? Thanks. Okay. Um, uh, thank you for your words. I have a quick two-part question. One is, uh, what is the role that your team, uh, General Secretary's Climate Change Support Team, is playing in the whole equation? Uh, second is, what kind of enforcement mechanisms are we discussing this time? Because we know the one of the main reasons for Kyoto Protocol's failure was the lack of enforcement mechanism. So what are the options that we are considering right now, even if we are considering to have an enforcement mechanism in the final text? Okay. Thanks. Um, on the role of the private sector, excellent question. One of the um, things we saw at the Secretary General's Climate Summit in 2014 was this unprecedented move by the private sector to be part of the solution. You had um, private sector um, companies, private sector organizations around um, organized around um, multi-stakeholder cooperative actions in high-impact areas. Areas r ranging from transport to agriculture, renewable energy, energy efficiency, um, oil and gas, um, short-lived climate pollutants, um, a range of high-impact sectors. All those sectors that, are, that were identified um, in the UNEP GAP report as offering the highest potential for enhancing mitigation ambition in the short term. We are re-engaging many of those stakeholders as part of the Lima Paris Action Agenda. That pillar in, um, uh, on the slide that I showed you on the Action Agenda, that is a unique space where the private sector can become involved in. And the French are, are fully supportive of this. They're pushing this. They, 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 
I recognize that it's better to have the private sector on the side of action and ambition rather than locking them out of the process. So, so the private sector, civil society, they're all engaged um, around delivering on the action agenda, which is a key pillar of the overall Paris outcome. To answer the second question, we're the Secretary General's climate support team. So we support the Secretary General in his um, engagements on climate change. Now the Secretary General does not negotiate. He, he is not a negotiator. The UN, he provide, you, you, know, you know, he he facilitates compromise between national governments. So we support him as he provides political brokerage to the formal negotiating process. Now the Secretary General, as we saw in the lead up to the climate summit, he, he also has unique convening powers. So in preparation for the climate summit, he was able to convene a wide range of stakeholders around climate action. Um, private sector, civil society, banks, insurance companies, oil and gas companies. So, so he continues to do that and we support him in his drive to mobilize stakeholders around climate action. Secretary General, as UN Secretary General, he also has the ability to mobilize the global public. Um, so we also support him in his outreach and mobilization to the global public on climate change. So those are some of the areas in general that we support the Secretary General. Now you ask a very good question on an enforcement mechanism. Um, uh, countries are still struggling with this. The reality is that we're dealing with 190 sovereign countries. No one wants using Jamaica and Barbados as examples, but you can use that for... Um, Jamaica will not want Barbados to tell it what it needs, it needs to do. But in the absence of a strong compliance mechanism, and I'm not ruling this out by any stretch of the imagination, countries still need a strong set of rules. Countries still need um, a system to measure, report, and verify um, the commitments that they um, pledge to undertake. So strong transparency provisions, um, strong rules need to be at the bedrock of this new um, agreement. And you know whether you have a complaints mechanism, as you have suggested, is another thing, but strong rules and a strong system of MRV and transparency is absolutely key to this new agreement. Just a very okay. simple question. Uh, when will the oh, sorry. when will the uh, video be available so that it can be brought to other audiences? Hi, thanks for the presentation. Um, I was wondering if you could speak to the role of civil society organizations at the uh, at COP. I was at uh, COP19 in Warsaw, and there's such a large contingency of civil society organizations, but it's hard to feel that they're making any direct impact in negotiations. I was wondering if you could speak to the role in the international forum or kind of speak to if it's more important to do domestic work beforehand and kind of just the interplay between domestic and international. Yeah. Okay. Maybe you I, can take yeah, another question now. Then. Um, global warming is one of nine uh, thresholds of which four have already been crossed. Um, it's just one part of a much bigger problem and we're not talking about any of the other consequences and I think we've got a little bubble going here that if we think that we can both have progress and it's a win-win world the way we're going, I foresee uh, plan B happening and that that by itself won't change our attitudes either. So I just don't, I don't buy limiting everything to 
the question of global warming because there's a lot of other problems that are massive and that you're not touching upon. And if you combine all of them, then the whole system's falling apart. But you're, you're able to smile the whole thing. I'm sorry. Um, I just I, I just don't see that the, that the real issue being addressed, even though every uh, you know you've, 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 you've dotted all the T's and you've put eyes above, above it. The, the, the about the eyes. So, no. We come back to it. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, on the role of civil society, I'm speaking as a former negotiator. You know, civil society has an extremely important role mm -hmm. to play in driving ambition, and um, I don't think that you can or you should underestimate the, the power of civil society mobilization um, in driving higher levels of ambition um, among governments and national delegations at the COPS. Um, I cannot answer how civil society will be how civil society representatives will be um, will have access to the venue, etc., at COP twenty one, um, because of course the COP is organized by the UNFCCC um, and the French presidency. But um, I've heard from the French in the briefings that they've given to us that they intend to ensure civil society. Um, has a prominent role to play in driving the outcomes at COP COP 21. So um, I would have. So I'm not. I would not be concerned if I were you over um, the role that civil society will um, play. Now, in term, as I said in my opening, the Secretary General sees. Um, climate change as being a threat multiplier, right? So um, countries in conflict situations, communities and countries living in vulnerable, who are vulnerable, who are marginalized, as the IPCC report says, climate change will exacerbate all those th threats and challenges. So while I might not address issues related to um, poverty in detail, insecurity, or marginalization. The reality is that climate change will exacerbate um, um, all of those problems, and it will be disproportionately felt um, in poor regions of the world, um, and it will be disproportionately felt um, by by the poorest and most vulnerable, most vulnerable. Um, peoples in all societies, rich countries and also poor countries as well. well I, have, I have one just quick question on this. There is um, the other view that a multilateral agreement is too hard to reach. Though uh, if you get a basic agreement among EU, US and China, which emit 45% 40, of or, or more of the uh, CO2, uh, it will be easier to reach agreements. I g guess your answer would be probably then the smaller countries would be the felt left out because of your latter argument there. But is that uh, a possible strategy thought about in, in Paris? This is my question. So, uh, but we can have more questions and just, oh, here's the lady. Hi, thank you for a very informative presentation. I have a question about the differentiation aspect of it. Um, CBDR was at the core of UNF, Triple C, and at the core of Kyoto Protocol. And I was wondering if in more recent discussions with the rays of China, rays of India, um, if there's been any new ethical um, approaches developing to how should we differentiate maybe emissions per capita or um, luxury versus uh, versus uh, subsistence emissions. What's happening in that 90-page document? <laughs> Is there <laughs> any insight? <laughs> okay. Um, first, to answer your question, uh, the reality is w we're far from that stage. Um, countries, the 190 odd countries, really um, are you know, yes, they all have 
different interests, different priorities, um, different national positions, and in real sense, different political economies. But the reality is that um, it would not be fair for um, a group of countries to impose an agreement on another group of countries who are disproportionately impacted by the problem they're trying to address. And um, to the, uh, you, you know, it is really amazing that no one has really put that publicly on the table. Um, if it didn't happen after Copenhagen, um, where um, the talks and the regime was quite frankly in trouble, I, I, certainly it will not happen um, on the road to Paris. Um, and and and, uh, but you know, it, it just would not be fair. So, um, on the question of CBDR. Um, Yes, it remains a core principle under the convention, and there are many options in the text on how it could be applied um, in a 2015 context. But as I said earlier, using India as an example, you know, India has 400 million persons who don't have access to to modern, modern energy services. How, 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 it just would not be, you know, I, 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 it just would not be fair to impose um, the same, uh, you, you, know, you know, the same target on those countries that, that you would um, impose, say, in, in a rich country. Um, but, they, but we need to find ways of ensuring that you that we can address the rate of growth in emissions in rapidly growing emerging economies. That's the reality. We, we, you know, we will not make a dent in climate change if these countries are not supported. And in the case of a country like India, provided with finance and investments to make the transition to a clean energy future. Um, Prime Minister Modi has made a number of ambitious announcements on um, solar and wind. Extremely ambitious. Um, 100 gigawatts of new solar capacity by 2022. Now, are those efforts need to be rewarded. They need to be supported. Um, not all of the resources and investments needed will be um, grants. I don't think that that's the expectation of the Indian government. But at the same time, um, countries who are willing, especially, you know, all, all um, countries, including the major economies, need to be supportive. But the reality is the new agreement will not be a new Kyoto Protocol. The Kyoto Protocol, only some countries had um, were obligated to make commitments under the Kyoto Protocol. Now the new agreement, it's applicable to all countries. So all countries, through a process of self-determination, um, will say what they can do, say what their contribution is to reducing emissions globally. So, so the regime has shifted. Two more questions. There was a lady there. One. Just a quick question on the Green um, Climate Fund. Um, I've heard many uh, civil society NGOs decry the influence of the private sector uh, corporations in shaping the agenda of the financing mechanisms that have happened around adaptation and mitigation measures and the effects that they have on indigenous rights and small rural farmers and the like. So I'm wondering what your hopes are in terms of crafting a green climate fund that has uh, accountability measures built into it an opportunity for you know not just the powerful private sector actors who have a great deal of influence and obviously the nation states that are desperate for that type of financing uh, have uh, some rules of the game of what actually gets financed on the ground 
and the impact that they may have in, in um, some of the developing countries. Okay. Um, um, maybe we have, is there somebody else? No. Okay, great, then we have, this was the last question. Oh, okay, but please, uh, short question. As far as poor countries, in the United States we developed, and Europe is doing that too, carbon credits. Um, how, how, what is your stand on that? Mm -hmm. yeah, okay. okay, sorry. Um, on the Green Climate Fund, um, in a formal life, um, I was intimately, intimately involved um, <laughs> in the design of the Green Climate Fund. And projects and programs that, um, that, that which will be supported um, by the Green Climate Fund must be, will be done through implementing entities. And these implementing entities will have to comply with pretty rigorous social and environmental safeguards. So um, there is a strong accountability framework built in to the um, approval process for projects under the Green Climate Fund. But I honestly believe it would not, ser it would not have served governments well to not have the private sector and civil society sitting around the table with governments um, helping to design the Green Climate Fund. And, and honestly, that is precisely what happened. There were representatives from the private sector and, and also representatives from civil society that were part of the design process and who continue to sit as observers with the ability to intervene and make presentations to the members of the board of the Green Climate Fund. So there is a balance between the private sector interests and the larger civil society interests. And in my view, both perspectives need to be heard by the board. Both perspectives need to be part of the decision-making process or processes that the board of the Green Climate Fund undertake. So, um, Yes, when one side doesn't always get get its way, it says stuff, and the other side the other. But both perspectives are important and certainly help to enrich the quality of the decisions that the board has taken as it operationalizes itself, as it operationalizes the fund, sorry. And those contributions will be extremely important when the fund is up and running because it needs there will be instances, instances where um, many of the potential problems that you mentioned will come up and you need the perspective and strong involvement of civil society to help the board to address those problems when, it, when these problems arise. But both, per both perspectives, both the private sector and also that of civil society um, are important perspectives that must be um, heard by the board. On the issue of market-based mechanisms, one of the good things of the Kyoto Protocol, and there were many good things from the Kyoto Protocol, I hope my presentation did not um, um, give you the feeling that, that the Kyoto Protocol was a complete failure and it was a bad thing. I'm speaking in the US, so I'm not sure if I will have tomatoes thrown at me or not. But, uh, but one of the really great things about the Kyoto Protocol was the market mechanisms that it created. The um, emissions trading, the clean development mechanism, and joint implementation. And CDM was a great tool used by developing countries really to promote sustainable development, to address um, emissions. But the CDM was also used to support <laughs> the vulnerable countries in their efforts to adapt to climate change. Um, it is my own personal hope, I can't speak on behalf of the SGO on this, but that serious consideration will be given to ensuring, to ensure that there, to ensuring that there's strong market-based mechanisms in the new 
agreement that will allow countries to offset emissions um trade emissions because it will be uh, it could potentially be a great source of income um for both sides develop and developing countries and it um and once there's environmental integrity embedded and the rules are clear um, um and set at the global level it will be um good for the system so um i i would be one who would support um market-based mechanisms being um once they have the requisite environmental integrity being part um of the new regime thank you very much for this wonderful talk and the very uh, considerate answers you are released for a short time <laughs> period <laughs> now okay. and uh, you so we'll see you then later um we want to continue with some uh, a discussion on the book that came out um and then after this we will relax a little bit with some refreshment and some drinks uh, we hope to get uh, this so maybe in 15 20 minutes or a shorter time period some discussion on the book going um lucas you want to come here no <laughs> maybe so um there are three uh, persons uh, who want to do make some elaborations on the book this is uh, michel de pass from the Parsons School of, uh, the, is from the um, Milano School, the Dean, she's not here at the moment, so then we probably will start with the second one, with Graziela uh, Janiski and then with um, Ali Khan, so we will have three uh, comments there. Now, um, let me just say, I don't want to speak much about the um, book contents, you can see this, what it, or let me get uh, comments from outsiders is better than from somebody who wrote the book but i just want to mention that this book is a result of a long process of uh, discussions here at the new school uh, we started four or five years ago with some project for the ilo and then we had conferences on uh, uh, economics of climate change uh, funded by the uh, walker foundation and then uh, we had another conference on uh, renewable energy and climate change um, that was also funded by the Walker Foundation, Thyssen Foundation, the uh, EMK, the German Macroeconomic Institute, and the German Science Foundation also stepped in, the German Council had stepped in here in New York. And we had um, then, um, mm, after these conferences, a number of public uh, lectures here. The lecture series the last three years were funded by the uh, Thyssen Foundation, and as I said, we got now a renewal for another three years to uh, have uh, a similar uh, public lecture series every semester here at the new school. And um, we had a great number of speakers here already, like uh, um, Runge Metzger from the EU as Commissioner for Climate Change, and we had uh, uh, Mark Jacobson here, who uh, uh, Actually, I think he triggered something in New York. Uh, he was one of the advisors here also of rebuilding uh, New York's energy base with wind energy. And now saw on the news the last few days there will be wind farms out in Long Island pretty soon, big wind farm farms that have been decided. And this was discussed a while ago here at the New School in uh, Mark Jacobson talk. We had a number of IPCC members here uh, giving talks. So uh, when we had all these experts basically here at the New School and uh, saw their expertise and had these networks, we started thinking, well, maybe time to have a book on uh, the macroeconomics of uh, climate change or macroeconomics of global warming that mainly addresses uh, economic, from the economic, macroeconomic perspective, the climate change issues like uh, first big uh, number of articles are there on uh, from uh, earth scientists or climate scientists Keller and others who show a bit what the state of the climate research is at the moment also experts from Columbia University were here like Peter Schlosser and uh, this uh, is an important part but then going from uh, uh, somewhat uh, 
uh, taking stock of what uh, research tells us than going into macroeconomic issues like uh, cap and trade or carbon tax or carbon capture or renewable energy um, as well as uh, impact of uh, mitigation and um, uh, adaptation policy on the um, economy, on employment and on um, long-run effect of the macroeconomy and so this was then uh, uh, partly a modeling, uh, so to speak, exercise by experts in the field. So there are lots of models and um, systems, uh, uh, mathematical systems in this, as you can see, which one needs in the research of climate change nowadays. Uh, I don't want to mention particular articles or chapters. The end of this is some very interesting outlook by what the uh, climate agreement, the history of climate agreement, and then also um, papers by James Hansen on carbon tax and Graciela Cicciolinski paper on um, the ca uh, cap and trade. Uh, so uh, there is, a, um, if you want to look at this as some kind of uh, resource for climate change debates, what you could use in education, in classes, what practitioners can use, what uh, IPCC people can use. There's a large number also of uh, literature discussed in the different areas. So that might be of interest for you. And the book is exhibited there. And uh, some flyers there that you can um, order this. Uh, since Michelle is apparently a little bit late, maybe we start with Graciela. You want to start first and make some uh, statements or some elaborate on what you think. Uh, uh, sure. You are contributing to the book, so uh, um, you probably know some of the other articles and what you think about. Maybe five, six, seven minutes, yeah? Sure. Yeah? So, Graciela, I, I must say, well, maybe I should introduce Graciela Zielinski. She actually was one uh, of the uh, great participants in the uh, designing of uh, the, 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 the mechanism in the uh, Kyoto Protocol, the cap and uh, trade system, but also her past breaking work in the uh, theory of uh, justice and fairness among generations. So the whole thing is not only, so to speak, the problem of fairness across the globe now, but the problem of fairness across, so to speak, generations this generation vis-a-vis -vis the other generations and uh, Graziela uh, wrote their past bill breaking articles on this so that were uh, very leading articles in the research. Oh, please. Thank you. Um, I will have to apologize because I don't have a lot of time. I didn't. Um, first of all, I wanted to, uh, to thank very much Willie for inviting me and for um, and, uh, Mr. Hart for very very good presentation, very fair, very clear, and very truthful. <laughs> um, of course, EOSIS plays a key role here. In my, in my view, it is the leading role for the reason that many people did mention here, which is that the last will come first. And the EOSIS nations don't emit less, they emit less than 0.3% of the global emissions, and they are the first ones at risk. So, you know, they play the critical role here. Um, now, I have to be very brief here. The cruel difficulty with the um, global negotiations on climate that we already have internalized and we don't even think about it, but we have to, is that of all the international agreements, this is the only one that pits uh, economic growth directly against the clean environment and maybe the survival of humankind. Because catastrophic climate change, with four or five Sundays per year, you will have a non-working New York City. So we get to think about that. It's not just the poor, although the poor are the ones that definitely are most exposed to it, and there is huge, uh, over 20 million people, migrant, are migrating because of climate change already. Now, that cruel fact that we take for given does not have to be taken for given. In fact, it's not true. 
we can have development that cleans the atmosphere. Mr. Hart mentioned C, carbon capture and storage. Forget about that. Let's look at carbon capture and usage. That means take carbon from air, make it into dollar belts. That would be a nice technology to have. <laughs> well, it exists. It has 10 patents in the US. It has one patent in Japan and is protected in 147 nations. I'm a co-inventor. I'm the CEO and the company just received in Silicon Valley the um, position of uh, world's top 10 most innovative company in the world in energy. So the company is one that I created for the reason of reversing the equation so that we can have more economic growth while cleaning the atmosphere. If we do that, everything changes, obviously. So how do you do that? Well, CO2 is a very valuable commodity on Earth. And it's a liability in the atmosphere. So the key is to have a technology that allows us to pull CO2 from the atmosphere in a carbon negative way, which the fifth assessment report says is the only way now to stay below the two degrees change. That's what we discussed. And it does so, so inexpensively, that you make money in the process. As you make money in the process, you join the policy interest with the commercial interest. All this debate about the private sector and business versus policy interest changes. All of a sudden, policy interests coincide with commercial interests. That has happened before in the case of the Montreal Protocol, where we found chemicals that were uh, practical and profitable that turned around the problem of SO2, uh, oh, sorry, uh, ozone emissions created by um, fluoro, uh, uh, chlorofluorocarbons. Now, we have a, an equivalent technology for CO2 is patented, is proven. There are two plants working in Silicon Valley, and you can come and look at them. And in fact, I'm here by inviting you to come to the Stanford Research Institute. I'm right now a professor at Stanford, a visiting professor, and you're invited to come and see the plants working. And the interesting thing is that not they make money. What do I mean by that? I mean that we have a $50 million commercial contract with NRG, which is the largest independent power producer in the United States, already signed. So I suggest a meeting with the CEO of NRG so that he explains why he thinks this is commercial, why he transforms CO2 reduction in the atmosphere into dollar bills, which is what is needed. I suggest a meeting with you and David Crane. He's a very well-known businessman, and his firm, NRG, is the largest independent power producer, has over 160 power plants in the US, and power plants, as you know, represent 45% of the global emissions. So they are the necessary and sufficient condition for resolving climate change. And this technology is carbon negative, which means when you finish, you have less carbon in the atmosphere than before you started. That's what we need. And how does it deal with the problem of poverty that was mentioned there, which is the crucial problem facing humankind? From where the global environmental problems derive? Because it's a north-south trade of resources, including fossil fuels, drawing on poverty that has brought us where we are. It is poverty that has brought us where we are through globalization and through international or north-south trade. So how, does it how can we deal with the problem of poverty here? And it's simple. If your kind support for my design, my suggestion, and the words that I wrote into the protocol for the carbon market continue into COP21, that's very important because you need to put the Kyoto Protocol structure whether you call it the Kyoto Protocol or whatever you want to call it, you need that structure. You need to put limits on emissions and allow the nations to trade when they go about 
the ones that are above the limits have to buy from the ones that are below. There we go. I just finished saying everything about the carbon market. We need to put that. For that, we need mandatory limits. How can that fit into the whole equation and deal with the issue of poverty? As follows. No green climate fund or take a piece of the green climate fund, call it the green power fund. Use the funding already existing in Brussels from the clean development mechanism that you so, were so kind about, which was so critical for so many poor people, as you know, as you said, and which helped China create uh, its clean uh, technology in the form of wind and solar, making China the biggest exporter of solar and wind equipment in the world. It was through the CDM. They got over $50 billion from the CDM. So now, the Green Power Fund would be a part of the Green Climate Fund that can draw money from the CDM. Therefore, the CDM will be funding the Green Power Fund, something that the Green Climate Fund doesn't have, doesn't have a source of funding. But we have a source of funding there. If we have the carbon market, the CDM in the carbon market is a source of funding. It produces hundreds of billions of dollars. That source of funding can be used to allow developing countries to draw offtakes and purchase power agreements to build carbon negative power plants, which exist today, in developing nations, particularly the poorest nations, and particularly the ones most at risk, like the EOSIS nations. That money can be put to work to clean the atmosphere, create development, and fight poverty with the existing funds and the existing structure that already is there in Brussels from the carbon market funding, which is $300 billion plus a year, and through the purchase, allowing the purchase of offtakes so that you can create these carbon negative power plants, clean the environment, reduce poverty, and create sustain, sustainable development. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, so now, I there is a little bit uh, delay of from Michelle de Paz. She was supposed to speak. Yes. She probably comes in a minute or two. I think we let now Ali Khan. You want to? Well, no, why don't you uh, continue? I think we just, uh, the people are looking at the food and the drinks here, so it's, uh, you better, um, we better continue and finish this soon. Uh, so Ali Khan is a uh, professor at the New School here, but also John Hopkins University, and we had long, long discussions on dinners and other uh, occasions. And he is working also on uh, climate models and growth models with, um, um, it's called the uh, integrated assessment models, where you have the interaction of uh, climate change and uh, growth models. And he is. Uh, um, a fantastic uh, theorist that uh, uh, grasps the uh, essentials of uh, the models immediately and yeah, please come here, first come here and we had the pleasure to meet a uh, long time ago and um, <laughs> now let's, let's finish this business first, long time ago and we are very happy that he wants to make some remarks. So. Um. Okay. I, 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 won't, I won't keep you very long because of the food. Uh, I wanted to thank Willie Ah, microphone. Okay, how does this, is this okay? Oh, okay, very good. So I wanted to thank uh, Willie Semler, uh, and I, I also have a copy of the book. I am privileged to hear uh, Mr. Hart speak, and then my friend, Professor Graciela Chilchinsky, Unfortunately, I'm not an expert, and I can't tell you anything about climate change. And I'm not a practical person. I teach. <laughs> and I teach theory. And I teach economic theory. And I tell you, I read newspapers a little bit, and I'm not impressed with the state of the world and with the state of cooperation, international cooperation, that is going on. It doesn't give me room for optimism. And in a sense, for climate change, I take I look at that background, this jaundiced background. I must tell you, I'm a Pakistani, and my country is also passing through some difficulties. 
And so with that background of the lack of what I see as international cooperation, then I come and say, forget about international cooperation and political economy or sociology or anthropology. Let us talk of economic theory. What has economic theory to contribute to the mix? How do we understand this tension between self-interest, the rational pursuit of self-interest, and quid pro quo reciprocity that is built into what we are taught and the way we cut and see the world? How do we build all of that into a problem which requires cooperation, which requires precisely these things to be, this basic behavioral urges to be muted. Where, how is that tension to, we are going to speak truthfully, so how is that tension going to be modulated? And Willie said, and this is indeed a book uh, which is a modeling exercise. So there are two ways, you take your science and you do the best you can, you do piecemeal engineering. But then you also use these problems to say, what is the problem with the science itself? So what are the two big paradigms of economic theory that will allow you to get a grip on the problem? And I'll take one or two more minutes. And the basic problems are interaction, self-interest, negligibility, time, open-endedness of the future. We have two basic models. We have the general equilibrium model with its basic theorem that individual pursuit of self-interest leads to social coherence. This is an 18th century idea, this is Mendeville's idea, private vices, public virtues. Yeah. The other is the game theoretic idea, and the game theoretic idea is interaction, and you don't get nice equilibrium. So where does climate change fit in? I don't know. <laughs> the experts are all here. But uh, there is maybe we should not do conceptual thinking. Maybe we should just do little by little. As uh, Mr. Hart pointed out, we, we do something here, we do something there, and try to make a better place than where we are from our own local perspective and try to do something there. But um, all in all, let me say, I read, uh, I read your introduction. I'm going to read through the articles. The top experts are represented in the book. The book is a very nice open, uh, very nice door to the room of, of, the, of the problems. And uh, I, uh, Professor Chichilinski left. Professor Chichilinski has this interplay between this, this life of activism, this via activa, and this life of contemplation and theory, the via contemplativa. She has two PhDs. She has a PhD in mathematics and she has a PhD in economics. And then she's an entrepreneur. So I look at her with awe <laughs> and admiration. And um, uh, with this book, with her article, and she brings in gender issues into the pact, and then she brings in survival, then she brings in this whole question of altruism and so on. So there's a mouthful here. I thank you for your hard work for the book. I thank you for that wonderful conference at which you made me sit between Mr. and Mrs. Uzawa. Yes. Uh, it was a nice event, and I look forward to the next stage. Thank you very much. Wonderful. Thank you. So, in fact, he's not an expert on climate change, but a great analyst of uh, the science and the economics that's going on these days. So, uh, we were waiting for Michel the past, but he's not here. Maybe we, uh, I think we can now uh, go to the other more relaxing part of the uh, event. And if in case she comes and may want to say some words, so we will call you up attention then to uh, maybe some remarks that she wants to do. Yeah, so thank you all for coming and so enjoy some uh, well food and drinks here that are ready for you to enjoy. Okay, thank you.